If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. As we are going through the Gospel of Matthew, let me get you the title of today's message. Greatness, Restoration, and Forgiveness. And those are just something that I stole from one of the headings in one of the study Bibles I was looking at. Greatness, Restoration, Forgiveness. So as we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew, um, just new insight, new things to be able to look at. Ultimately, um, for me, just taking it in, two big concepts came to my mind this week as I was studying and just going through this section of Scripture. I don't know if you've ever heard of, uh, what's the word? I wrote it down here. See, I even forgot the word, but I got it. It's called determinism. If you've ever heard of that word determinism. So there are some who believe that everything in your life and in my life is determined. The secular definition of that word, let me read it to you. The doctrine that all events, including human action, are ultimately determined by causes external to the will. Some philosophers have taken determinism to imply that individual human beings have no free will and cannot be held morally responsible for their actions. And again, part of why that came to me, but uh, part, of, part of why that came to me was, as I'm going through, I'm thinking, well, do we have a choice in the matter? Are we free will moral agents to do as we determine? As we determine, not it's determined for us. That God is going to, behind the scenes, do it all, if you will. And so we are just passive participants in this thing called life. And this is where it came from. It came from the current culture that we're living in and the ailments that people have. The sicknesses or the... The, the diagnosis. And I notice a lot of times those things, um, it affects our behavior. It affects the very thoughts that we think and how we take that all in. And so I wouldn't believe uh, that God would command us to do something that he would not equip us to do. But at the same time, can we really resist that? Can we really say, no. Or, or I don't have the ability to. And so that's where that came from. I've always thought about it like this. Um, I don't know if you guys remember when Oprah Winfrey was fat. But back when Oprah Winfrey, was, Oprah Winfrey was fat, I used to say, well, I don't think it would be fair if you had this expectation of Oprah Winfrey to run a 40-yard dash in four seconds or less. That's like world-class speed. Five, five seconds would be incredible, Olympic level right and so she she doesn't have that ability a person of that size doesn't have the ability to be able to do that and so the expectation for them to do something like that would be putting an expectation that is beyond their ability on the other hand the definition of free will as a biblical definition it says the bible paralleling adler views all humanity as naturally possessing the free choice of will. If free will is taken to mean unconstrained and voluntary choice, the Bible assumes that all people, unregenerate and regenerate, possess it. Now, you would think, Johnny, why are you doing this? Of course we have a free will. Well, there's an entire section of Christianity that teaches in five-point Calvinism, Reformation theology, that you don't have a free will. And that is the predominant voice right now in Christianity. For people who are in the know, it's a very... Um, Reformation theology is a very prideful doctrine. Because uh, it says that I'm chosen and you're not. Those who are going to hell, I, and you're not. And so therefore I'm in this, this exclusive category. But somehow God chose me, but he didn't choose you. And this is some weird, weird dynamics in that whole thing. Again, when we come to church, as I opened up in prayer before we started, it, it's supposed to be different than anything else in the world. And it's not a passive event. It's not we come to listen. Hopefully we come because we've prayed and we've asked God to speak through his word. 
And, and God knows where you're at, and God knows your struggles, and God knows your weaknesses, and God knows all of the things that surround your life, and He knows your propensities. And God wants to speak through His Word. The Bible says that God will not allow His Word to return to Him void. It will accomplish what He purposes, what He intends. And so in that, when we come to church, hopefully we come in preparation to hear what God has to speak to us through His very Word. And so as I've been going through the Gospel of Matthew, again, it's just, it's, it's confronted me, if I can use that aggressive word. It's, it's confronted me, this mirror, this perfect law of liberty that we're supposed to look into and be set free as opposed to be brought into bondage, like the world wants to bring us into bondage, like Satan wants to bring us into bondage, like my flesh wants to take me into bondage. This word of God is supposed to free us up and to deliver us. It's not supposed to be this burden that we carry around and can't, can't hold. And so the voices of the world and what I'm seeing in Christianity, the Bible prophesies that there will be a great apostasy before the coming of the Lord. In other words, many will turn away from the faith. But the beautiful thing about God is He has His way of bringing His kids back into the fold over and over and over again. And so we may go astray for time beings. We may wander off. And it's not usually through this malice of will that says, I hate God and I'm going to go worship Satan. It, very rarely, if ever, is it that. But through life and distractions and the ploy and the plan of the enemy, before you know it, we just find ourselves a degree off at a time and a degree off at a time and a degree off at a time. And before you know it, where the Lord was over here, we find ourselves moving in a direction and God lovingly, graciously just calls us back and says, Son, daughter, where are you going? Come back to the fold. Allow me to help you navigate through this thing called life. And so again, as we go through, I see these kingdom principles within Matthew that I'm learning and again, it's fresh, it's new, His Word is alive, it's, it's just this incredible thing. Greatness, restoration, and forgiveness, the title of the message, Matthew 18. Father, thank you so much for your Word. And Lord, I leave, I leave that free will and determinism, I leave it out there hanging. But Lord, as we study your Word, let's see how it is applied. Let's see how you... Help us to navigate through these lofty doctrines of men that they put it out there. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your Spirit says to the church. Open up our understanding, Lord. I pray that our hearts, and that is our part, Lord, individually, I pray that our hearts would be open to receive what the Spirit says to the church this morning. And so, Lord, bless this time as we offer it up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We had just learned in chapter 16 in Matthew's gospel that Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And that's a tall order, to deny yourself. And then to die to yourself. And then to follow after Jesus. But that right there in a nutshell is discipleship. That right there in a nutshell is Christianity. That right there is what God is calling each one of us to. We saw when Jesus went through the parabolic ministry in Matthew chapter 13. He had mentioned the, the contrast between wheats and tares. That they would grow up simultaneously if you will in the church. True believers and unbelievers growing up in the church if, of all places. And it was asked of his disciples, Lord, should we, should we pull out the, the wheat, the tares, the weeds? And he said, no, that's going to be done at the end of the age. That's going to be done when it's all said and done. I'll send the angels and they're going to take what offends. And so a lot of offenses in this chapter as we see it. Matthew 18, verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
If that were the question and that's what they were asking, it would be great. But Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, gives us the actual content, context of what they were asking. They wanted to know who of them was the greatest. And this was Jesus' perfect opportunity. If Peter would be the first pope, Jesus could say, well, Peter's the greatest. He's going to be the first pope. But Jesus doesn't say that. And I think what's taking place here in this question, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Again, let me read it to you. It's Luke chapter 9, verse 46. Then his, a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be greatest. And that's the heart of their question. I think they're asking the wrong question. I was at a school district, and I was over the transportation department. And there were three other managers in the school district. One was over maintenance, one was over operations, and one was over fields or facilities. And one of those guys was going to leave, and the other three of us went to our boss at different times and said, Hey, um, I know that that one guy's leaving, and I'll take his position, you know. Give me a little more chump change, a little $30,000 more, and you know, I'll, I'll assume that, because that position pays pretty hefty, Right? We're asking the wrong question. It would be very shortly thereafter that I would be fired from that position. And upon reflection, I can say, I should have been faithful with that one position. I should have been faithful before I was asking for more money, more responsibility, more stuff to do. I should have simply just been faithful. And so truly I was asking the wrong question. I think as well the disciples here, they may very well be asking the wrong question. They're looking at the kingdom as this thing, and they're, they're misinformed. They believe that the Messiah would come, overthrow the Roman government, set up his kingdom, and he would sit on a throne, and then they would rule on lesser thrones with the king of the kingdom. And that's what they're thinking. They're seeing it on a horizontal plane, and they're saying, hey... Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Jesus blows them away, verses 2 and 3. He says, Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become his little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You're talking about greatness in the kingdom of heaven? How about you make it to the kingdom of heaven? You got to be converted to make sure that you go to the kingdom of heaven. And so that's all of us. There are many who grow up in the church who say, well, I've been a Christian my whole life. Now, there's a point, there's got to be at some point that you were converted. I grew up believing in God. I grew up with the understanding that Jesus died on the cross. I grew up believing that the Bible was the word of God. And it wouldn't be until age 21 that I was converted, born again, eyes open spiritually, Holy Spirit now dwelling inside of me. Prior to that, I just had a mental knowledge of God and truth and an understanding of what was going on. But converted? I had yet to be converted. I was on my way to hell without God. And it wasn't until that moment that I was converted, I was changed, transformed, coming out of the kingdom of darkness and into God's kingdom of light according to the scriptures. And so the first thing he says here is that you need to be converted. What he's calling us to is childlikeness, not childish. God never asks you to check your brain out at the door. In fact, the Bible says if you're going to love God, you're going to love him with everything you have, including your mind. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so God's not asking you to be childish. He's asking you to be childlike. Let me give you some attributes of a child and you can ask yourself how many of these you possess. Number one, children forgive easily. They're not grudge holders. You ask for forgiveness and they just, they grant it. Don't hold grudges, as I said, full of love. Children just have this heart of love. They laugh. When's the last time you laughed? They aren't cynical or skeptical. They're not always questioning everything or thinking that there's something wrong with everything and everyone. 
Children are worry-free and carefree. They aren't full of doubt. Children are innocent. They express what they feel. They're uncomplicated. Unlimited energy. Man, I've I lost that one. Unlimited energy. If we could put it in a bottle and sell it, we'd be billionaires, would we not? Eager to learn new things. Marvel at creation. Butterflies, bullfrogs, tadpoles, flowers. It's just a marvel. They're imaginative. They're creative. They're playful. They dream big dreams. And children dance. And so are we childlike in those ways? Have we lost the simplicity and the innocence? No, I'm cerebral, Johnny. I think it through. I'm a realist. Okay. Jesus is calling us to be converted and to become as a child. Notice he goes on to say, verses 4 and 5, Therefore, whoever humbles himself, and so children are humble, as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. And so just the wonder of what that is, God in a, in, in a sense is calling us to be something that we wouldn't think of greatness, to be a servant of all. Just to look for needs that are represented right in front of us, right before our very eyes. Under the roofs that we live in, in the surroundings where we work, wherever we do life. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 35, the Bible says, And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And so again, that just contradicts what we think greatness is. We think if there's greatness, it's because people are going to serve me. And that's really what we're looking for. We're looking to be served. We're looking for people to meet our needs. For people to look out for us. And God is saying, well, my kingdom's a little upside down kingdom. You want to be great in my kingdom, then you need to be the servant of all. When I first gave my life to the Lord and heard these teachings and heard these things, I said to myself, you know what, man, I can do that. That's simple. God's not asking me to be cerebral. Or he's not asking me to have a higher IQ than I really have. He's not asking me to do something that I can't do. I can truly see a need and meet it. And that's all he's asking me to do, to be great in his kingdom. And it shows, the reality of our life shows what we're living for. Are we living for eternity and eternal things? Or are we living for the temporal? Are we looking to be served? Or are we looking to serve? And it takes, again, a humility like a child to just say, wow, my daddy in heaven has got this thing called life figured out. And I might not. He certainly does. I'm going to take him at his word. And that's what a kid does. A child simply trusts. If I were to take a table and set a child on that table and say, fall back and I'll catch you, they would do it joyously. They would like, oh, wait, I wasn't ready. Oh, hold on, okay, I got you. They simply trust. Put an adult up there. Wait, wait, hold on. Sure you don't want to put some mats down first? Put some mats, you know. I'm kind of big. I've been growing a little bit. You know, you got three guys, right, to catch me? You've done this before. Let me see your credentials. And we question and we doubt. and We have to make sure that it's taken care of. And God is calling us to trust him. Who are we trusting? He's got the whole world in his hands. Who are we trusting? We're trusting one who sits from a perspective where he sees everything. And he knows where we're coming from. He knows where we've been. He knows what our struggles are. And he's saying, just trust me. Let's walk and talk in this thing called life. Take me at my word as we go through this. It goes on now, verse 4. I'm sorry, verse 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned into the depth of the sea. And so here comes the offenses. And so God cares about his little ones, whether they're children or whether they're us, children in God, right? We're children of God. I think of the, um, it's been said that this, this verse should be placed on every college professor's desk, causing one of these little ones to stumble. I don't know what happened with our colleges, our universities, Marxists, socialists, communists, Atheist doctrines is what's being spewed out. And I wondered, as I went to 
took college courses back in the mid 80s, late, uh, early 90s. I just thought, man, this is really like, this is going to have to have some effect on our country at some point because this is what they're teaching. This is what they're ultimately going to believe. And these people are going to become the leaders of our world at some point, our country. And we're seeing, I believe, the repercussions of that. We're seeing the outflow of that. Like, who in their right mind would ever want to live in a socialist, communist country? Communist is atheism. It doesn't believe in God. And so it's just, it's, it's amazing how we see what's taking place in our world right now. But in that, God's serious about one of his little ones being offended. And he's going to contend with it. And he's going to deal with it. It goes on to say, woe to the world, verse 7, because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. The first woe is one of just pain in his heart. You know, offenses are going to come, but woe because of that. But then that second woe is a warning of judgment. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. And how serious is God about people who offend? If you struggle in an area where you are offending God's little ones, how serious is God about that? He, he gives us the instructions for what we need to do if that is us. He says in verse 8, If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better that you enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Jesus spoke more about hell than all of the writers of the Bible combined. And he's saying, deal with this definitively. If this is your habit of offending my little ones, deal with it definitively. Cut it off, pluck it out, do what you have to do. I don't think this is literal. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm sinning with my right hand, I got a left hand if I cut my right hand off. If I'm sinning with my right eye, I still got a left eye to sin with, right? He's saying deal with this definitively. Go to whatever necessary extremes you need to to make sure that you do not offend my kids. He goes on, verse 10, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And that's where we get the idea that maybe we have a guardian angel. We know that in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, uh, angels are given to those who would inherit salvation to watch out for them and to help them along according to the scriptures. So whether we all have one guardian angel or many angels looking out for us, well, at least right here, we see the understanding that they have an angel that is in heaven. Verse 11, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost, and then he gives us a little parable. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of, the fa of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And so we are those little ones. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible says that he who is, has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. I may go astray. I may get off the beaten path. I may leave the safety of the corral where the 99 are. But God promises that he'll come seeking me and he'll find me and he'll bring me back into the fold. And so we see three things about God's love in this little parable that he shares about the one sheep that's straying. Number one, God's love is unconditional. His love is independent of the obedience of the sheep. Notice he didn't kick the sheep. He didn't beat the sheep. He didn't go and chastise the sheep. His sheep was straying and he left the 99 and he went to go after that one that is straying. Even to the mountains it says here in verse 12. And go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying. And so, yes, there's an apostasy coming in the end times. Yes, many will turn away from the faith. Many will leave the church. Cathedrals empty in England, just throughout Europe. 
And so many will leave, but God's kids somehow make it back. How God does that, how it's, it's figured out again. Working with my free will and yet the sovereignty of God and participating, cooperating, some way, somehow, those sheep find their ways back into the fold. God's love is unconditional, number one. Number two, God's love is individual. He loves each of us as if there were only one of us. That's pretty powerful. God knows you. God knows me. He knows my weaknesses. He knows your propensities. He knows your idiosyncrasies. He knows your personality. He knows your, the things you struggle with. He knows how he needs to speak to you. God's love is individual. He goes after that one. Number three, his love is emotional. When the Lord finds that lost sheep, he rejoices over it. And so the fact that God rejoices when we're lost but we're found and he brings us back into the fold, there's a rejoicing. And so God's love is emotional. Verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Now we get to church discipline and it starts with step number one. It's a four-step process. But the first step is I go individually and I confront this person that has sinned against me. Yes, I'm to be gracious. Yes, I'm to be forgiving. Yes, I'm supposed to let some stuff, you know, fall off my back like water off the back of a duck. But if I'm offended, I have a right to be able to go to this individual between me and that individual and let the offense be made known. This is, again, church discipline in a nutshell. What we do is we usually go to, we skip steps one and two. We go straight to step three. Or we do all kinds of bad stuff. We gossip about it. We murmur about it. We complain about it. We do all kinds of stuff that the Bible doesn't tell us to do. If I'm offended by an individual, I get to confront that individual. And I use that word on purpose because there are non-confrontational people in this world. I am one of them. Guess what? God says, get over it. Confront the sin. If you're offended and it's something that is sitting with you still, deal with it. Be a grown-up. Go to that person and tell them their offense. I had an individual at work who... We had a meeting, and in that meeting, I used him as a negative example. I didn't name him, but the thing that he did, I used as a negative example. As I, I used another individual as well. And so these were some things that we're trying to get right in the department, uh, a direction that we want to go. And by the way, this thing happened, and we don't want to do that. And then this thing over here happened, and we don't want to do that. He didn't talk to me for three months. Ninety days went by. And I kind of noticed, and I was like, man, this kind of acting different. I don't know what's going on. So I went to him and I said, hey man, is everything all right? I noticed you kind of come to work and you do your job and man, I appreciate that. Way to go. But I noticed this has been, he goes, oh yeah, man, you don't even want to know. Dude, that meeting that we had? And I'm like, meeting? What meeting? Yeah, that meeting that we had? I said, bro, three, that month, three month, three month ago meeting? Yeah, that 90 day ago meeting that we had? Yeah, you used me and man, I was just, I was, I was offended. I said, bro, then why don't you come and tell me that you were offended? Oh, you don't want to hear what came out of my mouth if I told you that. I said, then why did you wait 90 days? Two, three days? Wouldn't have let the dust settle and you could have came to me man to man and let me know? And so he let me know and then I told him, I kind of enlightened him. Well, this is why I did that and this is how, why I did it and the way I did it. And he was like, oh, Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. I see it now. I said, bro, why would you let this beef come, this strife come in between me and you? God's heart is restoration. God's heart is reconciliation. God's heart is that we would be unified in the body of Christ. His kids in the kingdom should be unified. The Bible says in Romans 12, if it is at all possible with you, be at peace with all men. Some people don't want to be at peace with you, and so you do your best to try and do this. What happens when we go individually and we're able to talk to somebody? Reconciliation could happen. Or they can shed some light on, oh, I didn't even see it from that perspective. Hmm, never thought about it like that. Okay, well, that's why you come and that's why we have these conversations. And we can even leave the conversation agreeing to disagree. 
but at least God is honored in the process. Notice as we move on, step two, verse 16, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So step number two is, if I'm not received, if I'm received, then I've won my brother, I've won my sister. If I'm not received, then in that case, I take two or three witnesses. What happens with two or three witnesses? Sometimes I realize, oh, I thought I was high and mighty, and I was coming to you because you offended me, but I realize, huh, I, I have partial responsibility in this. I can apologize. And again, it's not who's right and who's wrong. It's reconciliation. It's bringing the, the relationship into restoration because God is glorified in unity. Moving on, notice the third step. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Again, that's the one that people like to come to right away. They come to the church. And I don't know exactly what this means. Tell the pastor, tell the, the associate pastors, tell some leader in the church. The purpose of this whole thing is excommunication for the individual that is not obeying it. Restoration is God's heart. We want to see reconciliation in relationships. But if somebody is a bad apple and they don't want to receive it, then they need to be excommunicated so that they can feel the brunt of the discipline so that they can repent, ask for forgiveness, and then be restored. Again, we're trying to get to restoration, but it's a process sometimes. So true story, I was one of 18 associate pastors at Calvary Chapel Downey, and I oversaw a ministry. And there was this guy that we needed to church discipline. It had come to our attention that this guy needed to experience church discipline. It got to the stage where we excommunicated him. And I'm the one that had the conversation and said, okay, this is your, this is your mandate. This is what you have to do. If you go to another church, you have to tell us what church you go to so that we can call that pastor and let him know what happened so that he knows what he's dealing with. But don't join ministry. You have to stay off of church ministry. Just sit under the word and grow in the word, right? He left and never Never did what we asked him to do. Roxanne and I are watching the news one day and on television, this guy is at a church with a gun in his hand shooting at the police as they are shooting at him. And we're like, what the heck? Man, the church discipline thing works here, Jesus. Thank you, it wasn't shooting at me, right? And so church discipline is a serious thing. And God is saying we should take these steps serious. We need to be careful to go through we don't want to offend unnecessarily, but there are offenders within the church. Jesus is saying, woe to those offenders. I will deal with them. He ended up going to jail, of course. You can't shoot at the police and have them catch up. Okay. Notice the last step in this, uh, at the verse 18, it says, um, I'm sorry, verse 17. But if he refuses, uh, tell it, uh, well, where is it? But if he ref refuses... Verse 17, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. That's the third. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. And that's the excommunication. Now, the heathen is still to be loved. The tax collector is supposed to be loved. But what Jesus is saying here is he's an unbeliever. In this case, he's probably an unbeliever. And through the sting of church discipline, maybe he'll realize, I need to, I need to surrender my heart to the Lord. Okay. So that's the whole purpose of that. Moving on. Verse 18. For assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus had already told us this prior in Matthew's gospel. Let me read you two quotes I have on binding and loosing. Ultimately what it's referring to is the authority that God is giving us in the church. Uh, commentator Bruce writes this. The binding and loosing gent general generically is exercising judgment on conduct here it's specifically treating sin as pardonable or the reverse david guzik writes what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven in this process if this process is done humbly and according to the word this is quite binding in the eyes of god even if the unrepentant one just goes to another church and so i think Whatever you think binding and loosening is, it's authority that God has given to the church and we can declare what God says based on his word. That's really what it is in a nutshell. All right, let's wrap up. 
Verse 19, again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. I think we hear that a lot when we see two or three individuals and we look around and we say, oh, God's in the midst of us. Yeah, we could do church or, or God's here now. This is in the context of church discipline. It's in the context of a witness. Two or three witnesses agreeing and binding and loosing the authority that God has given us. So it's not this lone ranger thing. It's not this one individual that is just saying, it has to go this way and it's this way or, or it's my way or the highway. No, no, no. Where two or three are gathered, God is there in this idea of what the authority that he has given us. That's the context. Is God in the midst of two or three? Yes. But God is in the midst of you and me when we're in our prayer closet by ourselves. When we're driving in our car and the radio's off and we just want to commune and talk to God. God is in the midst. And so again, I, I hear this scripture used as, as if God is not in the midst of us when I'm by myself. Of course he's there with us. This is the context of discipline. All right, verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. The greatest most respected rabbis in Jesus' day taught that you were to forgive an, uh, uh, an offense three times. And at three times you kick them to the curb and you're just like, okay, they don't get it. And so Peter comes along and he goes three doubled plus one. Hey Jesus, somebody offends me? Seven times, right? And Jesus responds, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Uh, Peter, you want a number? How about 490? All right, 439, 490, I'm done with you. No, it, like lose count. Don't count. Just forgive and keep forgiving. And then he gives us this parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Let's call it a billion dollars. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Really? You're going to pay a billion dollars? No, you're not. But all right, you're asking. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A hundred denarii in contrast to 10,000 talents is one six hundredth of that amount. So if it was one billion dollars, then it would be one thousand six hundred and sixty-six dollars. That's what we're looking at here in offenses. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying the exact words that he asked his master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him into the torture to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And so Peter comes to Jesus and says, if somebody offends me, how many times should I forgive him? Seven, Jesus? Jesus says 490. 70 times seven. Keep forgiving until you lose count. And then he gives this parable. One guy owes a billion dollars to his master. And he comes and he begs him and says, forgive me my debt. And he forgives him. And then that same individual finds somebody who owes him $1,666. Grabs him by the neck on a chokehold. And says, pay me everything. And he throws him into prison. 
And then somebody tells the master, and the master comes and says, bro, I forgave you a debt that you couldn't pay. Somebody owed you a minuscule amount, and you didn't forgive him? And then the whole thing, it comes to us. We've been forgiven a debt as Christians that we couldn't pay. God forgave us and is allowing us to go to heaven. And then he says the audacity of us to harbor unforgiveness towards people. Now why is God saying this? I think it's for the benefit of us. Harboring unforgiveness is like eating rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. I eat the rat poison and then I'm waiting for the rat to die and God says it's going to pollute you. It's going to poison you. It's going to make you bitter from the inside. And people all around you are going to be able to see it. That you are harboring this unforgiveness. And so we need to be very, very careful. Why is God asking us to forgive? Because whatever was taken from us cannot be given back. It's already been taken. And I think that's very, very important for us to understand. It doesn't mean that we can't hold people accountable. It doesn't mean that we can't go to court and testify against somebody who's done some injustice to us. It means from the inside, we need to release them of the debt that they owe us because they can't pay it back. It's been taken. And God says, don't become defiled. On mission boards, people who want to go to the mission field, the number one disqualifying reason why people cannot go to the mission field is they harbor unforgiveness and they've become bitter and through the interview you're able to determine this you're able to see this and what are they going to do with that bitterness in serving God go tell people how miserable they are on the other side of the world on a mission trip God doesn't want bitter representatives you're not representing this gracious loving forgiving God you're harboring unforgiveness and you become defiled the Bible says in Ephesians 3 432 and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus would be asked, how can we pray like you, Jesus? And Jesus would give them what we call the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. On and on, forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. After that, he gives a commentary on one section of that prayer. And he says in verses 14 and 15, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I opened up with this idea of free will. I opened up with this idea of determinism. I opened up with this idea of apostate, that the church in the last days will be apostate. If you look at the church today, it is a group of individuals that live in the most autonomous culture that has ever existed in America and we are extremely self-willed. We do what we want to the degree that we want, when we want, how we want. It's crazy. It's crazy. But yet God has this remnant and He has always had a remnant. He has always had a minority stake in every community of people who have come out from the world and said, I do not own my life. He bought me with his blood and he tells me how to live my life. He tells me what I need to do. It looks like I run the show. If it you, looks like you run the show, then you're your own God. He is to run your life. He is to tell you what to do. And I look at the heart of God behind this whole thing of forgiveness. We act like it's some bad thing. Oh my God, God telling me what to do all the time. Now I got to forgive these people that offend me. Well, the option is or be bitter or be miserable or have a chip on your shoulder where every time somebody touches that little area, you fly off the handle. Wow, yeah, that's, that's great to live with. That's great to be around you. No, that's miserable for you and miserable for everyone around you. God's saying, surrender that to me. Give that to me. I want to heal that area. I want to restore that area. I want to make you sensitive in the lives of others in that area so that the comfort that I give you, you can give it to somebody else. He says that exactly in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And so may we be very careful to understand that our 
lives have been purchased. God bought us. He owns us. There is a group that are tares growing up simultaneously with wheat. And they look the same. And what's at stake? Heaven and hell. Eternity with and without God. Going through the tribulation period that is... <sighs> Before I say amen in my closing prayer, the Lord may very well come and rapture His church. I mean, He is at the door. If we look at the signs of the times, if we know anything about prophecy, the Lord is coming and He's coming soon. Let's pray. Father, may we be sober-minded about this thing called life that you have given us. And Lord, living in this culture, so autonomous. Lord, we get the impression that we get to run our lives. We get to pick and choose what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, how we're going to go about it. Or, we can be a child of God in recognition that you are our Lord. And you tell us what to do, when to do it, how to do it, to what degree. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be childlike in our trust for you, allowing you to lead us, to guide us, allowing you to strengthen us to do what you are calling us to do. In these last days, living in this world, I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't think so autonomously that we would live life independent of you, but Lord, thanking you for the autonomy that we have in this country and yet using it as a strength and not a hindrance, not a burden, but this wonderful thing, Lord, where you want to lead us and guide us each step of each day. So thank you so much for what you've blessed us with. Continue to grow us up in the things of God. And Lord, when we stray, and we all stray, I pray that you would bring us back into the fold and the safety of that corral and fellowship with one another and looking to serve because we want to be great. For your glory in Jesus' name, amen.